Hey, I got something really exciting to share with you today. Now, pretty much every time I teach a workshop, I have people ask me about the shoes that I wear, which are called sokwa, by the way. So I train in these shoes, I teach in these shoes, I've explored in these shoes for around about four years now. And if you train Tai Chi Chuen, you'll know it's pretty difficult to find a good shoe to train in because you need something that's durable, that's going to last, uh, but also something that provides maximum connection to the floor. And that's why I use these shoes called Sokwa. So they use this plastic micro-thin 1.2 millimeter thick sole that outperforms rubber. And I know this from experience. The ones that I've got now, I've had for about two years, the sole is still uh, in great condition. They use neoprene sides that insulate the foot in hot or cold weather. And what really seals the deal for me is that they almost feel like you're not wearing anything on your feet. I mean, it just feels like a sock with a, with a sole. So they're super, super comfortable. It's like walking barefoot, basically. So like I say, I've taught in these shoes. I've run through jungles in these shoes. I've spied on the beach in these shoes. You can even swim in these things. And you can just throw them in the washing machine whenever you like to get them clean. They're, they're really, really cool. And they're way better than the traditional cotton slippers that most people use for Tai Chi, which just disintegrate after any kind of length of time. So what is cool is I've spoken to David, the CEO of Sokwa, and he is offering listeners of this podcast and basically anybody who visits my site, warriorstrategy.com, He's offering you guys 20%, okay, that's 20% discount on anything you buy through their store if you click through the ad on my website, which is in the sidebar. So if you want to make use of this 20% discount, you just go to warriorstrategy.com, have a look in the sidebar for the green Sokwa ad. It's like two or three rows down in, in the sidebar. Just click on that Sokwa ad. It will take you through to the Sokwa site and you're going to get the promotional code which will give you that discount. These sh shoes are super cool. I'm telling you about them because I've been using them for years and I think they're really cool. So enjoy the discount guys. Hello there, this is Robin Gamble. Welcome to the Scholar Warrior podcast. Now the idea of the Scholar Warrior has been around for thousands of years across many great cultures. And the concept is this, that one of the highest achievements in society is to become skilled in the martial arts while also pursuing the scholarly pursuits of painting, poetry, music, philosophy, and more. So it's here that I interview martial artists as well as artists in various fields so that you, the listener, can gain a peek into their techniques, skills, and strategies for success and so that you, the listener, may gather these gems and apply them on your own path to self-mastery and excellence. Enjoy. I enjoyed recording this episode with Ken immensely, and you'll probably notice and feel that this interview is a little different from most others that I've done. And that's because most of the time I record a podcast over the internet, and with Ken we were face-to-face. In fact, let me paint the picture for you just a little bit. Imagine Bangkok. It's a tropical metropolis uh, that pulses with life and sound. Motorcycles weave through traffic. Horns beep. You can smell street food being cooked on many street corners. And you can often hear the construction of the next skyscraper going up. So with this background, I journeyed across the city in a taxi to meet Ken uh, in his apartment. So his apartment block was off a busy road, a very typical Bangkok, and journeying up his kind of nondescript concrete stairwell, and then stepping into Ken's place, his apartment, was a trip, because it's just not what you expect. It's really cosy, and it's decked out with wood, and it basically feels just like the cabin of a ship. In fact, that's what he calls it. He calls it the ship cabin. Uh, it's, it's really otherworldly. And the view is a treat too, because miraculously, instead of skyscrapers, there's greenery and actually a winding river that you can see 
from his window with a Thai Buddhist temple on the bank. So it really does feel like an oasis in the middle of this city. It's, it's, it was very strange and very enjoyable. So it was here that we lounged on his sofa, we drank uh, green tea, and we chatted and jumped into the subject of traditional Chinese medicine. Ken is an internationally acclaimed writer, teacher, and practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, which is often referred to as TCM. He's taught classes in nutrition, diagnosis, and clinical supervision in New York. And he's also published on TCM, cancer treatment, and nutrition. He's also presented at prominent conferences in the US and across Asia. And cop your noggin around this. He's an American who's presented talks on TCM to Chinese audiences in China on multiple occasions. And that is quite a feat. So he now lives and works in Asia and uh, predominantly at prestigious resorts. And he's worked with clients ranging from CEOs to celebrities. And a couple of things that really impressed me about Ken is um, how he's used TCM on himself to overcome very serious health issues and get back uh, on form and back to health and back to happiness. And also he's the first acupuncturist that I experienced that could specifically describe the sensation, uh, the different sensations of the needles were as they were inserted into different parts of the body. So each a needle had a specific feeling which he could describe that you were going to feel as the needle went in. And I found that very impressive and interesting. So I hope you enjoy this chat with Ken. I enjoyed it immensely. So I hope you do too. So here we are in Bangkok in Ken's apartment overlooking uh, a river. It's a very, very nice afternoon and I'm going to ask some well, I'm going to wait for the boat to go by on the river first. And then I'm going to ask Ken some questions about TCM and uh, get some nuggets out uh, for the listeners to, to enjoy. So first thing uh, I want to ask about Ken is uh, you mentioned a couple of times when we've been talking that TCM saved your life. So what exactly does that mean and how did that happen? Well, you know, as a young boy, I was diagnosed with uh, Hodgkin's disease, which is a kind of lymphoma, and I received radiation therapy. I had several organ operations, splenectomy, had my spleen out. And anyway, to really make a long story short, um, the radiation damaged my chest to the degree, as an older man, that I needed to have a, a new aortic valve put in. Um, and how does this get back to Chinese medicine and saving my life? <laughs> It was the Chinese medicine and the yoga before going in for that operation, and it was the acupuncture and yoga after that operation that really, really made the whole operation so smooth um, and so seamless. And um, continuing today, acupuncture not only helps me professionally in terms of paying the bills and all that business, but also just personally to sort of really help reset my nervous system in a very particular way so I can get quality rest or I can be active with good quality and my batteries stay charged. Okay. So when was it that you started really getting intrigued with, with TCM and then actually taking up the study? So what was it that made you take the leap into, into studying it? Sure. Well, as I said, I had a childhood cancer. And then years later, because of the radiation therapy, evidently, it's, there's a high rate of thyroid cancer with, with people that got radiation therapy back then. So they decided to take out the thyroid gland. And that little operation, which seemed like it was going to be so innocent, was very, very hard. Very hard. And it was after that that I said, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way of looking at the human body and, and treating the human body and being proactive rather than just reactive because my whole health life or medical life to that point to the 13 year old was very reactive and I wanted to sort of get in the flow so to say so that meant <clears throat> that you you did your research and you went to 
they call it traditional Chinese medical school. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I I thought about going and becoming a medical doctor. I thought about becoming an Ayurvedic doctor. I thought about becoming a homeopathic doctor. I thought about becoming a naturopathic doctor. Um, but it was Chinese medicine with its roots in in primitive science, a very old science that was based in yin and yang, and it wasn't so dogmatic and, and rigid and structured that it could be used for almost anybody, really, and it could be used to be interdependent um, and, and really catapult people into the right flow for their lives. So can you remember the, when you first walked into your a traditional Chinese med medical class and was there kind of uh, obviously the theory is very different from Western medicine was it was it shocking or was it something that you already knew about how, how did it feel the first kind of week of classes or, or something oh, it was it was completely shocking you have to understand I was coming from a New York film world film production world and I had driven across the country to California, which all the loony bins live out there, right? So I drove out to California, and I was studying this weird thing called Chinese medicine. I remember my father even saying, you know, if there was any proof to that, you know, it would be bigger around the world or whatever. And here we are today, and how big is it around the world and getting increasingly bigger? And the reason why that's true is because people are getting results. So you can go to England and find a really good acupuncturist. You can go to Italy and find a really good acupuncturist. Um, it, it is a global medicine, and, and that's what really hooked me in, I think, was that it was based on being proactive. And um, so when I walked into the class that first day, I remember looking around and seeing people with, with tattoos and, 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 you know, piercings on their tongue and, and all this sort of stuff. And I made my, you know, usual human judgments right away, which were not pretty, um, but then I realized that everybody has something to offer, really. So the girl with the pierced tongue, she's looking for the same thing I'm looking for. Maybe she's had her own health challenges, and that's what brought her into Chinese medicine. I don't know. But it was, it was, a, it was a challenge to learn the medicine, for sure, because it is such a different way of thinking, a different perspective. And it was, it was you know, it didn't make sense that you put a needle down by the foot for a headache didn't make sense or back pain it didn't make sense to me and I can't say it, it completely makes sense now but through 20 years of practice and seeing the results over and over and over and over and over and over again I must say I'm 20 times more impressed with Chinese medicine today than when I first started uh, studying it when I first started studying it I was a skeptical New Yorker um, and today I can really talk with you now saying I'm, I'm a, a mid-season practitioner. I would say mid-season, I'd like to say. <laughs> so was there, I mean, you, you've mentioned over the years you've, you've been impressed over and over and over again. But was there a first time that you got a treatment or gave a treatment and there was such an improvement that it, it kind of burned into your memory early on. Was there any initial treatment that really hit home? Yeah, sure. There, there were a couple. One for myself, the first time I got it. I don't know what I didn't know what the guy was doing to me. I mean, I hadn't felt that peaceful inside in my whole life, and you know, he helped my back pain. So that was interesting right away. And then after nine eleven, of course, I was uh, you know near near the pile as we referred to it. And I was treating rescue workers, and I could just see that, you know, one or two points in the leg was taking away shoulder pain. One or two points in the leg was, you know, helping necks, helping sleep. Um, so that was impressive. And then um, another treatment I gave that's sort of a legendary treatment for me was this, 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 um, this friend of my sister's, her mother was getting older, and she was starting to hallucinate really badly and um, really very angry. And um, I needled two points to help calm spirit in her ears only. And she started frothing at the mouth like it was a, an exorcist or something. It was really scary. And this was early in my career, very early in my career. And it was a hot attic in New York in the summertime. And she was frothing at the mouth. And she was an elderly lady. And it was quite scary. And the, my 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 sister's uh, friend said, don't you think you should take out the needles? And thank God, even early on, thank God, something told me, don't. 
hang in there, be strong. And I did, and I think a couple minutes later, after she said, do you want to take him out? I said, no. A couple minutes later, a, a wave of peace came over this elderly woman's face, and she seemed really at peace, and she wasn't frothing at the mouth. And from what I hear from the daughter, she never again had another hallucination, and she was really sharp right up until the end, which was a long time. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an imminent demise at all. Um, it was a long time before she really passed on, but she was really in her head and really lucid, and th that's what meant the most to the daughter, of course. That's a pretty dramatic. <laughs> that's a pretty dramatic story. Well, there's a lot of those stories <laughs> in this business, I think, in any any practitioner for sure. Right. So. Um, do you know what, what what occurred in in that instance See, from a from a from a traditional Chinese medical perspective? Sure. Well, I would say that would be um, that would be phlegm obstructing the heart. That's the simplest way of putting it. it. Would be phlegm obstructing the heart, and the phlegm harasses the mind and the shen and, and the spirit, and then you get all these signs of sort of manic, crazy behavior with a lot of phlegm. Really, fire and phlegm would be psychotic behavior. It would be the combination of those two things, you know. And phlegm is just congealed dampness. And I, phlegm's not the best thing to talk about on a on your <laughs> podcast, but it's important. It's important. It's important. So we we jumped into the to the jargon there, um, which I, I would presume that many people, if they've not uh, dabbled in in traditional Chinese medicine, they'd probably be a little bit confused by now. That when when we're talking about heat and phlegm in the heart and stuff, that sound it's another language. It, it feels like another language, I would imagine, for a lot of people. I remember the first time I heard that that kind of um, language it was talk about damp in the stomach and I, I was coming from a western medical perspective it just it made no sense to me at all so how about now we're going to jump into the art a little bit uh, into the the art of traditional chinese medicine and maybe just explain some of the the major 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 concepts um which are going to hopefully be of benefit to to people and then they may know a little bit more about what, what, what we're talking about. So um, can we start with yin yang, which everybody's heard of, surely everybody's heard of, but probably most people, um, they, can, they can think about that circle with the swirls in and the two dots, and they mm -hmm. think that's, that's yin yang, and the world's made up of positive and negative, but um, obviously there's, there's more to it. So how does that play into traditional Chinese medicine as a, like an overview? Well, it's the basis of all Chinese thought and all Chinese medicine. And, and yin and yang, just to go over the characters very quickly, yin shows the shady side of the hill and yang shows the sunny side of the hill. So there's this idea that neither is just light on and off. It's not about that. It's about shade and sun and the interplay between the two. Um, so really, I like to think about yin as sort of blood and substance and muscles and skin and organs and you know matter yin is is that bone you know your substance of yourself um, and then your your yang is your chi it's your energy and of course the character for in, in chinese for chi which is energy or breath showed us a pot of rice cooking and steam coming off the rice so there's this idea that some impression you get from the tangible, some impression you get from the material that sort of gives off an energy about it. And people are in touch with this. I mean, we're using funny words like yin and yang and chi. But, you know, when you go pick fruit out at the grocery mart, you're, you're trying to pick the best one, the one with the best chi, or vegetables, or the fish with the clear eye, or the, you know, whatever it is. Unfortunately, in this world, if you look at a, you know, a, a frozen dinner, you know, it doesn't have a lot of chi, you know, but, but food has chi, real food has chi, of course. So, so we've got this interplay. It's an interplay of, of forces. So if we're looking from, from Chinese medicine, um, how is that going to affect the way we look at someone who's ill, for example? Uh, how does yin yang af af affect them or their problem? Well, I mean, I would say that, that, that 
there could be different areas of the body that are more yang, so we could look at it that way, or different areas of the body that are more yin, like the feet are more yin um, because they're lower on the body, whereas the head is more yang because it's on the, the top of the body. It's closer to heaven, so to say. And indeed it is. You stand up and it's closer to heaven. Um, but it applies to life because it's, it's this idea of balance, right? And that's what people want. That's what people want in their workaday lives, and that's what people want in their restful lives. They want a certain amount of activity, but then they also want a certain amount of rest. And I would say as we age, which I talk about quite a bit, is that we, 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 we develop a pattern of yin deficiency. We become sort of, we drain the batteries quicker than we can recharge them, so we get this pattern of yin deficiency, which could manifest with night sweats or or feeling restless or uh, many different things. But that's a, sort of a global diagnosis of how busy the world is. You know, people always ask you, "How are you doing?" Oh, busy. And it's not really how you're doing, but okay, we'll let it slide this time. <laughs> no, I just think with the yin and yang that that that. That is the ultimate sign of balance in the Chinese system. And yes, they are two funny words, yin and yang, but you could also think about it as your heart filling up with blood and then your heart pushing around that blood. So there's this idea that yin is blood, it's substance, it's rest, it's relaxation and whatnot, and yang is active and dispersing. You know, when the blood gets pushed around the body, that's more yang. And you could, you could think about yin and yang in terms of your your lifestyle, your exercise, your your religious life, you know, in terms of, you know, do you need to do more active praying or more, um, you know, sedate praying, more reflection or more volunteer work or something like that. Uh, it, it does apply on many levels in many ways. And, you know, I think people in China probably get their PhD in yin and yang theory. Um, I, I don't aspire to that, but but it's, it's, it's a lifetime of my study, that's for sure. Mm. Okay, so and then then we've got qi. Everybody is hearing about qi, and you've you've mentioned about uh, you know basically what it is, and uh, it, so it stagnates as well. It flows and it stagnates in the body, mm. right? And uh, so how, how does that how does that work into TCM? Well, qi again is that character of sort of energy flowing, and it's sort of like uh, there are meridians on the body that people have heard about, or channels, or rivers, or as my French teachers defined them in English, they said um, networks of animation. And that's chi. Animation is chi. Animation is yang. Animation is chi. Um, and chi is energy, it's breath. There are 10 different types of chi, which I'm not going to go into each different types of chi, but there's immunity chi, there's digestive chi, there's, there's, uh, there's many different types of chi in the body that, that help do things. And chi has many different functions, like holding things together or keeping things warm or um, so on and so forth. But the idea behind chi is it's this breath of life that's around us. Star Wars does a good job with that, with the Force. You know, it really is a good definition of chi in a lot of ways because it is everywhere and people do sense it. And if you feel somebody come up behind you when you're sitting down at a desk, you feel them, you know, and that's an energy. So people get it. People often, when they, they, they know about traditional Chinese medicine, they may just think that's acupuncture. That's putting needles in, in, into people. Uh, but there's way more to it than that, right? And, and I've heard you talk about the five branches of TCM before, and I think that would be pretty useful to hear you freestyle on. Could you tell us about the five branches? I wish I could, I wish I could go freestyle on it. I'll try for <laughs> you, Robin. Um, so, yeah, the five branches were developed during the Han Dynasty in China, and this was a time in China when they wanted to get rid of all the shamans and the witch doctors. They wanted to have a structure of medicine that made sense and that was interdependent. It wasn't just about somebody doing an incantation and sort of trying to heal somebody. It, was, it made sense. It was logical. So the five branches, just quickly, we'll take a tour. We'll freestyle. So the first branch is lifestyle or exercise. 
right? And this is this is really your art, which is great to learn learn some from you. You learn along the way. So exercise is the first and most important branch. And of course, they didn't have health clubs or qigong classes way back when. But people realized that there's something to good rest. There's something to good activity. There's something to good movement. Um, and there's something to being able to defend yourself. You know, they realize that your lifestyle is the first and most important branch to think about with your own health. And I, I, I regard that close to my heart to, 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 to today. The second branch is nutrition, which um, is a huge field of study in and of itself. And it's the branch that brought me into the medicine personally. Um, it's what really got me interested in in, in Chinese medicine. And I'll just quote Michael Pollan because that's the simplest advice I can give your listeners about uh, nutrition, which is eat food, meaning whole food. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants, right? So eat whole food, not too much, mostly plants. And I think that's the simplest way to boil down nutrition. The third branch is acupuncture, which we've talked about these meridians in the body, these rivers in the body, these networks of animation in the body. And yeah, it didn't make sense to me when I first started going to school that you put a needle in the hand for the headache, but now it makes utter sense to me. And, and because the proof has been there time and time again of pe either myself getting treated or uh, treating other people. And then the fourth branch is herbal medicine, which of course is what people know a lot about Chinese medicine because they think of the old herb shop in Chinatown with the drawers and the smelly things and everything else. And that's all part of it. You know, your roots and your berries, as we used to say in school, your roots and your berries. You know, that's all part of it. Um, I would say I'm probably an elder teenager in my herbal medicine practice. I use probably 10 formulas for most things that come down the pike. Um, but thank goodness I've had good success over the years. And I would also say that herbal medicine is almost like focused nutrition in a lot of ways, because it really is. You're taking these natural substances, you're de decocting them, you're boiling them down, you're, you're um, creating some a brew from them to be able to affect change. And herbal medicine is based on 28 categories of herbs, and then the herbs are combine, so tonify yon, tonify yang, calm spirit, many different categories of herbs, tonify blood, there are many different categories of herbs and they are combined into formulas for diagnosable patterns, right, diagnosable patterns within the, um, in, within Chinese medicine, like yin deficiency, like menopause, so there are formulas for menopause uh, and whatnot. So the last, the last branch of the medicine is structural uh, medicine, and that's akin to uh, you know, Chinese twina, medical massage, Thai massage, chiropractic, physiotherapy, massage, physical touch, you know, it's all manual medicine. And, and one of the things I think the future of is really is getting something called chine sang, which is a stomach massage. And I think, uh, you know, we, we hold a lot in our guts and to sort of have somebody work on a place that's tender, I think is worthwhile. It's a very comprehensive range, isn't it? I think if I could just add that, that I think that right now in the West particularly, and maybe in the East as well, I don't know, but we don't, we don't think about treating psychological issues with acupuncture. It doesn't, it's not on our radar at all. We don't think about t treating emotional or mental issues with acupuncture. And I will say, after 20 years of experience, that acupuncture is best at treating mental and emotional issues. That's what it's best at and then pain, and then rest or sleep, you know, that's what it, and, and those are the three modern problems anyway, um, and then, you know, you have these funny patterns like digestive patterns and, you know, kidney patterns and everything else, and they're all very treatable within the system, and I think, again, if you think about those five branches, they are a framework to sort of understand life between heaven and earth. The meridians of the body, is there anything that, that uh, people should should know about the meridians? I think in the Western system, we think about them as imaginary, that we don't think they really exist. And I, I will say after 20 years of practice, they definitely exist, without a doubt. And, and, and e even in the Chinese classics, they follow muscle lines, and they even follow, um, you know, arterial lines, you know, blood vascular lines. So they are very real. And if a Chinese medicine classic says, 
a point at the end of the finger can arrest a heart attack or something. I, I believe it now. I don't, I don't question it anymore. I, I think I spent years questioning it, years and years. Um, even the, uh, the fact that a real meridian could exist, you know. But now I do not question it at all. It, it's, it's very, the results have spoken to me over and over. So, sorry, a point in the end of the finger can arrest a heart attack. Yeah, well, like, that was the old story when I first went to school, I think, and I watched this show called Healing in the Mind or something, and it was this Western guy who went to China, and he was involved with Nixon way back when, and he sort of helped get acupuncture into the States a little bit. And the, the story was that if somebody has a heart attack in China, that they take a cigarette lighter and they burn the end of the finger, uh, um, either the pinky or the middle finger, to help arrest the heart attack. And if that doesn't work, they bring in the defibrillators and they try to rescue the guy. So what I love about the modern Chinese system is that they, they, they try to rely on these ancient ways first, which, if they, you know, it's cheaper, quicker, and more natural. Um, and if they don't, they rush right in with the modern stuff and they don't even think twice. I do have an interesting story, uh, if we just have a moment, uh, that uh, many years ago now that I was uh, in a 7-Eleven parking lot with my brother and a woman next to me in a car started choking. And I instantly jumped out as a Chinese medicine student thinking I could arrest it. And I grabbed a point on the inside of her wrist to try to arrest it. It didn't do anything. So I ran inside. I said, call an ambulance right away. And I went back out, relocated the point, grabbed it a little stronger. Instantly, it arrested it. She stopped choking and she was fine. Um, so, and she looked at me like, what did you just do? And all I was doing was my, my work, right? That was all I was doing. What on earth were you doing? What point was that? It's a point called pericardium six or ne guan, which is, means the inner gate. And it's about three finger breaths on the inside of the wrist, three finger breaths up in the middle of the wrist, in between those two big tendons. And there's a big nerve that runs through there. And when you grab it, you release that nerve somehow, and it helps open the chest and calm the heart and provide good sleep and help with nausea and many other functions. That's a fast, that's a pretty amazing story. <laughs> you probably could have saved a life there. Um, would you like to tell us anything? Well, in fact, I know there's a couple of of topics that you're that you're particularly passionate and knowledgeable on, in terms of nutrition and rest. So, could you tell us a little bit about nutrition from a from a TCM perspective? Well, of course, uh, nutrition's the second branch after your lifestyle. Um, and it's very important. I mean, nutrition is foundational medicine. It is really foundational medicine. And, and I, when I used to teach nutrition in New York City, I used to, the first day of class, I used to walk in, size everybody up with my little monkey eyes. And I'd, I'd size everybody up and I'd say, okay, what's, what's, nourish, what's, what's nutrition mean to you? What does it mean? What's the word root to nutrition? And everybody would say, you know, carbohydrates, calories, you know, minerals, whatever, vitamins, you know, different things that we have, these little catchwords, slogans, we have good slogans. And I said, nutrition comes from the word root, meaning to suckle, like a, like a, you know, a baby suckling on a mother's breast, nourish. And I think my, my big message to, to your listeners is that nutrition goes way beyond food. We're so focused on food, you know? And yeah, we can. We all know what's smart and not so smart. We do. Um, but, you know, we make some silly choices because of convenience, because of being rushed, because of just desire. We make some silly choices. But nutrition is much more than just food. It's a good book you read. It's a good yoga class. It's a good time with a friend, you know, talking about things. Um, nutrition is so primary. It is... Labels are secondary. Nutrition is really primary. Um, you've mentioned that uh, one of the major problems you deal with is people not getting enough rest. And also I've read some excellent articles uh, by yourself and one of them, one of them being on rest. And uh, I found it very, very beneficial to understand more about rest and how to, how to actually do it. Uh, which which sounds a little bit, it sounds, yeah. What, what's the word? 
It doesn't sound, I mean, it sounds obvious. Everybody should know how to rest, but we're increasingly put into situations where we, we don't seem to be able to rest. We come back from work and we stick on the TV or we look at the phone, we look at the iPad. Even when we're resting, we're not resting. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on rest and the importance of it? Well, that article was one of the most exhausting things I've ever done in my life, period. It took me two years to write that rest article. But I, I am I'm happy with how it came out as a piece of art, really, and a piece of research. Um, I am happy with how it came out. But I think rest is one of these primary things. It goes in the lifestyle. It's the first branch of the medicine. Are you getting enough rest? Um, and I think because of how fast the world has become and and I can't believe I'm even saying that because when I used to think about this I used to think about the world was fast but this is even 10 years since living in Asia it's a faster place you know it's a faster place so with everything revving so fast our CPUs and our computers or our phones or our engines and our cars or whatever it is everything revving so fast you drain the batteries you know, the old saying of burning the candle at both ends is a good one, and an apt one. We need to learn how to charge. We need to learn how to discharge on an, on, a, on an even level, or a more stable level, I should say. And then we need how to learn how to recharge authentically. And that's one of the things about acupuncture that I've been most impressed with, is how it's able to give you an authentic psychological psychic and spiritual charge you know it really does charge things up on a, le a level that that is untouchable really um, so rest is has been the, a study for the last couple of years for me I uh, have been sort of forced into a position of doing more rest for myself and I'm appreciative of it you know I'm appreciative of it um, but my only my only advice to your listeners is you know if you if you are burning the candle at both ends you know charge ahead of time just you know give yourself permission that is the key word give yourself permission to get some better rest and it doesn't it may not be you may say well i don't have time you know and we all don't have time i can tell you that but what you can do is when you're out there in the yang when you're out there in the sea of people is you can find a moment to take a deeper breath to, to unclench your brow, your eyebrow, to um, stare off and be in awe of everything around you. So, and that just reminds us, it's just a simple reminder that everything in life really is perspective um, and that we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously and that we should just look around and, and be appreciative. There's a couple of um, phrases that that I've heard you use from, from the Tao Te Ching, which obviously is very, very famous, uh, or the foundational Taoist text from China. And um, I, I've heard you use them a, a couple of times, and I think they're really worth mentioning. And one of them was softness overcomes hardness, um, which is not only popular with people interested in Taoist thought, but also Tai Chi people like like myself, because it's been applied to martial arts as well. Mm. Um, but I heard you use it in reference to acupuncture, and I think it's pretty pretty interesting. Uh, could you could you freestyle on that? Sure, I can freestyle. But before I freestyle about the soft overcomes the hard with acupuncture, I think you know just look at male and female. I mean, uh, you know that's just very basic right. in terms of the soft overcoming the hard, um, for sure. It's just the most basic. Um, but acupuncture, it came to me a while ago because I have studied the Tao Te Ching for many years and I'm no closer to it, thank God, but I've been studying it for a while. And, and then I was practicing this form of, of acupuncture. I was practicing acupuncture and I was seeing that, yes, people, people may be hard and tense when they come in to see you in their shoulder or their back or wherever. But when you get that little needle in there, your body has no choice but to soften to that small little needle. And that's really explaining the negative feedback loop of acupuncture, where it sends a message and your body and your psyche and your, your psychology and your viscera can soften in relation to that small little needle in your foot 
Whereas your your you know the needle will not soften, your body will soften. So that's another example of the soft overcomes the hard. Another one uh, is, is it soften the gaze? Yeah, that's one of my favorites. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I was trying to remember what I wanted to say when I talked with you, and that was the that was the saying that was coming up is soften your glare. Yeah. Yeah, soften your glare or soften your get gla- uh, gaze. And yeah, it's oftentimes when I'm I'm doing little lectures or big lectures, I can look into the audience and see people's eyebrows that are tight, and you know that's the face of resistance, that's the face of anger, that's the face of shoulder pain, you know. So, you know, soften your soften your glare, and you know, on the tube you have a choice to do that. On the bus, waiting for an airplane, you have a time to do that. There are times during the day that you can rest. Even in the midst of it all, there's still these little moments where you can find the eternity. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, you know, that someone may have if they were to come and see a, a, a traditional Chinese medical practitioner, and um, just see what maybe some of your initial words would be. So someone walks into you and says, "Ken, I am stressed. What should I do?" And of course, you can't give a full diagnosis. You'd have to see someone in person. But I'm stressed. What should I do? Well, I think, again, just getting back to, you know, sh- stress is the opposite of rest. <laughs> really, it, almost, it sounds like it almost, doesn't it? Stress is the opposite of rest. So I think it comes down to perspective right away, shifting your perspective and shifting your ex- uh, perspective to a perspective of gratitude, um, as difficult as that may be at the particular moment. Uh, and then I would say that that breath. Breath is really, you know, your lungs are your intermer- intermediary organ between yourself and the world. It is your most direct connection to the world outside of you. So when you think about the heart as sort of the king in you, the lungs are sort of the prime ministers. And there's sort of that rhythm of squeezing out the air and gently filling up with the air helps calm the heart. And maybe your heart doesn't need to be calm. Maybe you need to go running. So you're, you're breathing faster and you're moving things. Maybe that's what you need. Or maybe you need to sit still and take a couple deep breaths. And that, that's the simplest answer for stress relief, really. Someone walks in, and this is, I think, becoming more and more uh, a factor in Western society, and they're depressed. Well, there are several different diagnoses for depression in Chinese medicine, but, um, you know, it depends if it's frustration or over-worry or overweight. There's, there's different ways of looking at it. So it's, depression's not just depression. There's different kinds of depression. So you need to really focus in on what kind of depression... And I think, again, gratitude is the attitude. I think making peace with what is, you know. And I think in somewhere in the Tao Te Ching is like, if you can see how sick you are, then you can really move towards healing or something like that. I'm paraphrasing very badly, but that's the idea. And yeah, you know, if you're able to look at the darkness, then you know where the light is. You know, and that's just like Jungian psychology or Jungian shadow psychology. But, you know, the parts of ourselves we don't like are the parts of ourselves that we need to look at first. So we know where we can go and, and try to be that idealized self of ourselves. Um, this is a problem that, that uh, you know, I've, I've certainly noticed with a lot of executives that I teach and uh, people that are spending a lot of time at a desk, and that is office syndrome. I've got a headache, I've got neck ache, I've got shoulder ache, and my wrists ache, um, and I'm stressed. <laughs> uh, so they... <laughs> well, that, that is a common thing. I, a while ago, the Bangkok Post here in Thailand interviewed me about office syndrome, and my answer surprised her because everybody always thinks it's your posture and and whatnot. And yeah, good posture is important for sure. But it's more about how you're reacting to things. So if you're getting a bad email about something and you're subconsciously reacting to it, 
it's probably causing your shoulders to go a little bit up more by your ears. Like it's like a small car accident in your mind. It's like you're overreacting in your mind and you're resisting is really the best word. And you're causing your shoulders to go up by your ears, and you're causing things to be more tense. And by the way, the most common syndrome is weak back and upper excess. Too much pain in the upper, inflammation in the upper, and too much uh, weakness in the lower. And especially as we age, that makes sense, right? Um, so, office syndrome. Think about, you know, what's coming out of your computer or what's coming into your eyes and your ears. And think about how you're relating to it, I think, would be the good answer. You know, are you, are you like, punching it with your mind at every minute? Is that what you're doing? Are you punching it? Or are you growing around it and learning how to be flexible in the face of life's adversities, whether it be a bad email or a cranky colleague at lunch, you know, simple stuff. So <clears throat> that brings us to the, to the part of the show where I'm going to uh, just ask you some fun questions, quick fire, fun questions, where you can freestyle. And there's five minutes. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, have you been reading these or not? No. no. <laughs> okay. Not at all. <laughs> all right. So, Ken, tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. Sure. Uh, well, I would say that um, a lot of times when, when um, nobody agrees with me on, I would say that uh, people, people can over-intellectualize things too quickly. Well, maybe everybody does agree with me on that, and that's just <laughs> something cute I'm saying. <laughs> Your favorite quote, if you have one. I do, I do. The, the one that came to mind was what my grandfather said, which is, uh, do not do what you enjoy, but enjoy what you do. That's golden. That is golden. It, is that just your granddad? or did it, yes, did, I don't know. It is my granddad. But, yeah. Well, thank you, granddad. Yeah. Um, what do you like to do in your spare time? Many things, uh, but I like to cook a lot. I cook a lot. I, I, nourishment is important. Um, and I, I exercise quite a bit. Um, I'm still active, which is great. And um, I do love to rollerblade. I like to rollerblade in cities. I've rollerbladed in London. I've rollerbladed in New York. I've rollerbladed in Bangkok. I, I do like rollerblading. And I think uh, daydreaming is probably one of my f best activities these days. You know, it's just how I get my yin now is sort of good daydreaming. And then it's a way of charging my battery for myself. Favorite movie? Uh, Reds with Warren Beatty and um, I can't remember her name. Uh, the Annie Hall girl. Diane Keaton, I'm sorry. Yeah, so Warren Beatty and... and um, Diane Keaton. Very close second would be The In-Laws with Peter Falk and Alan Arkin. Very close second. If you want comedy, watch The In-Laws. If you want great hist history, uh, watch Reds. Uh, a good a book, documentary, or movie that is an introduction to TCM? Well, the, the book that, that I would still recommend is written by my, my teachers and friends, Harriet Beinfeld and Ephraim Korngold. And they're from San Francisco, but they really wrote an incredible book on the five elements. And I know we were thinking about talking about the five elements, and I really would direct your listeners to getting this book, Between Heaven and Earth, because it is a classic. It is a new classic on Chinese medicine and the five elements. And, and the real paradigm that they set up very quickly in that book is, you know, in the East, it's doctor as gardener, and in the West, it's doctor as mechanic. And I think that's the key thing that differentiates the paradigms between the East and the West. A good theme song for your life. Steam by Peter Gabriel. Okay. Um, you can have dinner with three people, living or dead. Who do you invite? Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, and... My father. Uh, any final comments for the listeners? Uh, who, who, they could be executives, professional people, martial artists, scholars. If, if you've got a sentence or, or two that you would offer them, what would it be? 
you know, be flexible. And how can find how can people find out more about you? Read your read your stuff. Uh, connect with you in in any way if they need to. Sure, my website's pretty easy to re remember. It's just www. Spa, S P A T C M dot com. So spa T C M dot com. And if you go to the media tab, that's where all my writing is, and you can download the article on rest or an article on sweat or um, different, different articles about different things about Chinese medicine, like acupuncture and whatnot. Highly, highly recommend checking out Ken's website, which I have on multiple occasions, and doing as he says, which is looking at the articles that, that he has written and, and that have been published uh, in China. And, um, I mean, just to give you some, some reference, Ken has gone and lectured in China to Chinese people on Chinese medicine. <laughs> and he's got an excellent way of writing about it and making it accessible. So if you can check out the articles on his website, um, highly recommended. There's even things like uh, the, the type of actions you, you should be taking in winter. So as, as the change in seasons come by what could you be doing differently to safeguard your health and and be healthier and be happier and uh, they are very very good articles ken thank you so much uh yeah i hope to connect again soon thank you robin it's been a pleasure okay cheers brother hey guys and girls before you go i want to tell you about the mindfulness for modern life bundle i've created for you you can get this for free when you sign up for updates at warriorstrategy.com. Now in this bundle, you're going to get an 8 Tai Chi Twin Performance Enhancers PDF, a powerful Qigong video, and a mindfulness audio track. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to warriorstrategy.com. Hey, this is Robin Gamble, thanking you for listening, hoping you enjoyed the content, and kindly asking you to share with your friends if you did. Thanks again and see you next time.